Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let's start with uh, upcoming uh, deadlines. Uh, tomorrow you have your first homework due, and I think I mentioned this already a few times, so I think that's clear. Um, I want to remind everyone that in case you realize that this course is not great for you right now, that the drop deadline is this Friday, where you can do so without any uh, consequences. After that, you can uh, withdraw later on, but you will have uh, a special mark in your transcripts. Um, next uh, Monday, we will not meet here because for us, there is a holiday and we will get a little rest. Um, and then next Monday, Monday after that, we are going to start with our paper discussions. Um, after the drop deadline, I will have a you know now fixed list of uh, students who are enrolled in the class, and that will enable me to make a plan for these uh, discussions. So, um, yeah, I will send an announcement, but very soon, in a couple of days, you will get uh, your assignments for these uh, paper discussions, where we are going to have this role-playing seminar where you will play a role of uh, original author of the paper and you're presenting at the conference or you're a person who is finding uh, older paper reference in this paper, uh, stuff like that. So uh, very soon you'll have information about that. And for undergrads, uh, please let me know uh, if you are sticking around with the course uh, by the end of this Friday, do you want to participate in all the roles, meaning you want to also present in the class or you want to stick with this uh, discussion as this assistant roles, which are mostly writing notes or summaries or stuff like that. So you won't be presenting here in front of the class uh, in case that's uh, more comfortable for you. Grad students, you do not have an option. You will need to um, stick with the roles. I <laughs> um, so yeah, undergrads, please uh, don't forget to let me know uh, what, you, what you want. Okay, any questions about these? these upcoming things? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will assign papers. So yeah, if you don't know, there is um, a reading list document. <clears throat> Just a second. Um, if you go to the course webpage, uh, here you have uh, different links, including the Google Drive. And in this Google Drive, you have readings. I'm putting all the references I have in slides here. And then here, I will also post what are the readings. Um, I will not post all of the readings, uh, I'll, you know, all, all of them uh, immediately. So you want to know if you are assigned to, I don't know, paper discussion number six, you won't know immediately what that paper is going to be. Um, the reason is that kind of like as I'm preparing the materials, I also got to get the sense of what I think would be the nicest paper to read. So I, I want to keep that flexibility of, you know, um, in case I don't get to talk about certain topic too much in the lecture, then I can, you know, use a paper that we discuss uh, next time. So yeah, but you will get one or two of them ahead. Any other questions? All right, so I want to go uh, through what we talked about uh, last time. We talked about uh, uncertainty estimation. And the reason why we talked about that is because we deem that showing confidence scores can could assist human AI teams. If the confidence score of a model is very high, we read that as the probability of this prediction being correct being really high, which gives us a signal that we could maybe go along with the uh, AI's decision. And otherwise, if the confidence is too low, we would not. And um, then we have seen there are different ways to calculate uncertainty. And I kind of focus on the max of the softmax vector because it is uh, kind of very simple to, to, to get that uh, vector. That's something we will certainly have because we are doing uh, some sort of classification. Um, and although, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I certainly have heard people using uh, term probability associated with the softmax values. 
Um, and then it's kind of easy to get trapped into this thinking that, okay, yeah, the softmax value have this probabilistic interpretation when they do not necessarily have so. And we, hold the, we talked about the problem of calibration, that neural networks are not uh, well calibrated, meaning that if indeed take the uh, soft ma the max of the softmax vector as a confidence score, um, that that we are we want to use the interpretation of yeah this is the probability of this prediction being correct, but that's not not necessarily true. And we have seen that with the example of a digit classification where a model that has never seen anything else than digit was given a photo of a dress and it predicted it's a digit eight with 100% confidence. Other way to, of reading that is that if we are kind of slapping this uh, nice intuition behind confidence scores that we want, we would read that, oh, the model says that the probability of this dress being a digit eight is 100%. Like it's 100% it's correct that this dress is a digit eight, which literally makes no sense, right? So uh, this is how uh, these uncalibrated softmax values can be uh, problematic if we if that we misinterpret them, or rather slap interpretation, which is very nice to them when they do not have it. Um, and then to measure how wrong this interpreta interpretation the, that the confidence score is the probability of this prediction be correct uh, is is uh, how how wrong we are are we when we say that interpretation we introduce the expected calibration error so that number that number in the end tells us how far we are uh, or our confidence scores are from the being uh, a measurement of the probability that the uh, prediction is correct which is our kind of ultimate goal right if if our so if our ECE is not low, we know that the max of the softmax or whatever other confidence score we have uh, used could not assist human AI teams, right? Like if the person was playing around with that digit classifier and they have seen 100% confidence, meaning to be, yeah, I should go along with this prediction that would be completely wrong in whatever they were doing with these digits. So, that's where we stop. And now the obvious step is, okay, let's imagine a situation where we got low ECE. What do we do now? What we can do is our, our some simple post hoc calibration methods. Um, and one of them, the most, I think, widely used one is temperature scaling. With temperature scaling, you are assuming you are using softmax based classifier as I have been assuming all along. Um, and we, what we are going to do with temperature scaling is to rescale the logits. Um, let me go back to the example of the, uh, of the dress. So with the dress example, we had 100% um, confidence. Uh, and let's say this confidence came from the max of the softmax. So uh, as an input, we had an image. And in this image was a, a dress of a, dress and we classified this uh, image into a vector of uh, 10 classes, right? Because we have 10 digits. So we have one, two, three, blah, 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 eight, nine, 10. And this one was predicted to be uh, eight uh, with 100% confidence. Now imagine that that confidence was calculated with the max of the softmax score because it was 100% here we had 1.0 and everywhere else we had uh, zeros because the softmax value need to sum to one. So in one of these softmax uh, values, we had the highest value possible and everywhere else uh, zero. And we would call this kind of uh, uh, a distribution that we get out of softmax to be really peaky. Um, given that the model never seen anything except digits, more ideal situation would be that instead of having this very, very picky distribution here, if we have something more uniform, right? If we had values 0.1 everywhere, or you know, 0.1, and then maybe here 0 0.08, and then here 1.12, and this class is predicted, and we use the max of the softmax scores, we would get only 12% of the confidence or point uh, 12, however we represent it. So this would be a nicer situation, right? 
And this is the idea behind the temperature scaling. If you have these peaky distributions, but you do not want them, you will make them more uniform. Uh, and you will make them more uniform by choosing appropriate uh, scalar T here. So if um, basically this, this equation here is your softmax, uh, softmax for particular dimension in the softmax vector, and you just divide it uh, in the normal soft, uh, softmax, we don't have this term here. We do not divide by the scalar T. So if we increase this scalar, uh, scalar T here, what we are doing is we make this, uh, all of these softmaxes more uniform. And if we are making the, uh, the softmax smaller, it's going to make one of these uh, really high. So depending on what you want, you will either make your distributions more uniform or more peaky. And it depends on whether your model is overconfident, then you want to reduce its overconfidence and you will do it by increasing T, therefore making distributions uh, distribution in uh, softmax values uh, more uniform. And if your model is not confident enough, it's underconfident, then you would need to use smaller T to increase its confidence. And with neural networks, uh, I think the situation where the model is co overly confident about its incorrect prediction is the, is uh, more, more common. And this, Temperature scaling is a simple extension of plat scaling. If you know what's that, it's associated with, with SPM. It's not important, but it's a nice to know that there is a disconnection if you know uh, what plat scaling is. Okay, so the question now that's probably in your minds is how do we choose T? And we do not set it ourselves. We actually learn it from the data. So what we do is we have our train set where we train our model. Our model is now a train classifier. It can do certain things, but not necessarily with the uh, proper calibration. So we want to calibrate the logits out of that uh, model. And to do so, we are going to have a held out uh, set for calibration. This would be your validation set, uh, for example. And there, you are just going to minimize the negative log likelihood, meaning you are going to use cross entropy loss between uh, logits over, you know, divided by the temperature parameter and the labels. And you will initialize your temperature with one, meaning as if there is no temperature. And then you are going to uh, optimize T. You are going to change T's values until you find uh, the, the minimum of this loss. Once you have calibrated your logits, you are then going to, uh, you, by calibrated logits, I mean you find appropriate T to divide the original softmax scores. Then you are going to use that version uh, to make the final predictions on the, on the test set. Okay, so basically that's it in terms of temperature scaling. Uh, I think it's very simple and that's probably why it's so widely used. Um, and this could be, you know, when we start working on projects, I said you should always have um, uh, confidence scores being your baseline and your explanation should add some value, some utility to confidence scores. I think this is a great baseline to use. You, you have your softmax scores, you calibrate them, and then um, you, you present the confidence out of calibrated softmax to be your uh, confidence score. Something very simple. Uh, that said, there are more complicated approaches. Uh, I will just touch on them very briefly, but before we do that, uh, let's stop here to see whether there are any questions. One thing to have in mind is that even if you calibrated on your uh, held out calibration set, you still might have uncalibrated values for your held out test set. And because the C is uh, your model of choice, you should never use your held out test set to tweak it. Um, so yeah, there, there is always a problem, there, there is always going to be a chance that you are still having uh, uncalibrated um, values. Um, you can calculate ECE to see how uncalibrated they are, but then you cannot go uh, and check, use the test set to calibrate T. 
because then that's cheating and you didn't achieve anything because if I now bring a new held out the set is probably still going to be miscalibrated. That's a very broad question. What do you mean by interpretability of the score? For example, you said if we get points uh, thirteen, we can say uh, we don't rely on this model for even. But in this case, that we have multiple tables, it's possible all the tables are the correct tables, but everyone gets about twelve percent or fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. I see. So you there are. You are talking about situation where multiple labels are the correct labels. There is an extension of uh, this uncertainty estimation for the uh, multi-label classification. I can give you a pointer. It's in the tutorial as well. They don't go into details of it, but uh, there is a nice work that uh, extends uh, stuff like this to it. Yeah. All right, so I said, this is not the only way to go about calibration. And um, if you if you ever touch anything uncertainty rela related, you will certainly uh, find uh, some kind of Bayesian approaches. Um, they are a little bit funky to describe because there is, you start with a scary integral and I immediately lose you. So I, I don't wanna even, go into the actual math of it. I will just quickly give you an the only the only thing you need to know about Bayesian approaches for then seeing a few examples of uh, uncertainty calibration with that kind of approaches in mind. So the main difference between Bayesian approaches and the you know, prototypical uh, setups uh, I have described to you so far is that uh, we don't care about one model as a definite answer, but rather we are interested in a spectrum of models. And um, if, you, if you know anything about these approaches, most likely you have heard about the Gaussian processes and you have seen uh, a visualization that looks something like, uh, excuse me, you, you have seen like a, a line and and then uh, they might diverge a little bit, but where you have the data, it's, they are kind of close, uh, stuff like that. So they are all widely spaced, but in any case, each one of these lines represents one model. And we care about having multiple of these, not just one of these uh, lines to fit our data. So that's a main difference between uh, the Bayesian approaches and other approaches. Um, and when I say we care about the spectrum of the data, uh, what I mean is that we assign the probabilities of to each one of these possible models based on their compatibility with the data, which is uh, kinds of things we have been talking about so far. We always cared about fitting the data, but not only that, but also our prior beliefs. So uh, for example, if we are modeling weather forecast, we might have certain models in mind in terms of humidity or uh, dryness or whatever it might be uh, a model that pays more attention to some factors that influence the weather. And we deem that certain, let's say here around Salt Lake City, we might deem that, I don't know, wind is very, very important for our microclimate and we would put uh, using our prior knowledge about whether in Salt Lake City we would put more probability to the model uh, that is considering wind really, really well compared to a model that's not. Then we would have some evidence, and this is a like standard machine learning uh, that I've been showing you so far, where now you see some data and you can calibrate your probabilities for these models based on that data. You might have thought that wind is really important, and then it turns out, ah, actually, it's not really important, and rain is more important, so the model that is really designed around rain should have more probability. And 
Then after you have seen that, you will update these probabilities for the model based on your evidence. And that's kind of it. I mean, each one of these uh, descriptions have a mathematical notation associated with it, which I intentionally didn't want to show up because this is not crucial for understanding uncertainty stuff. Uh, uh, but just have in mind if you know someone mentions variation, something you will probably see at least one integral involved. And once you have done all of this, then the calibrated prediction is kind of weighted average over all of these uh, these models. It's calibrated in a sense that didn't you didn't just look at one of them, but you have looked at multiple models, and in that sense, some noise has been canceled out. Now, how, how do we actually uh, achieve that? How do we have multiple models if we are having a classification task and neural network involved? There are two most prominent approaches and the only one I want to talk about. One of them is uh, recommending to apply a dropout. If you don't know what dropout is, it's just a technique where you randomly uh, replace a certain fraction of your parameters, meaning model weights with zeros. It's uh, been introduced uh, before pre-training and really important to have models that uh, generalize well, because uh, then you kind of uh, force the model to not rely on certain parameters too much. So you can, at the test time, apply dropout randomly multiple times, and that will give you a few versions of your model. So if you apply uh, dropout 10 times, but randomly, so 10 different parameters will be picked, you in a way are getting 10 versions of your model. And then you can uh, put all of your evaluation data through each one of them, and you will for each one of the instances, your evaluation data get uh, get a, a prediction, and then you can uh, average these uh, predictions. And the other one is to use assembles of different training runs. So instead of training your your model once, you train it uh, a few times. Again, we can train it ten times. All your models can have some seed related to it in terms of how you shuffle the data. Uh, what kind of uh, if we had worked with randomly initialized uh, networks, then we would have different random weights in the beginning. So there is always some randomness involved in uh, training a model and actually very prominent approach to reporting variance of your, let's say final accuracy is to train model about five times and then get predictions from each one of them. And then uh, accuracies out of each one of them and say, huh, what is the variance of the accuracies you got? And you could uh, you could also calibrate your probabilities by uh, not taking as a final prediction prediction out of one of them, but you average all uh, all three of them. Um, and this is kind of neat because, as I said, it's very common to already train your model multiple times when we you know uh, report uh, results of our proposed model in the paper. So nothing stops you to actually do this because you usually you do have three to five models trained. Everything I said is, I think, pretty straightforward, but it is annoying. Um, we do not like when we train this model now, oh, you need to do that extra step of compiling those uh, logits across different models, uh, especially with dropout, like, oh, I don't now want to apply it. So it's kind of more or less laziness. I don't think there is a really uh, concrete reason why we do not, as the final prediction, use the assemble of models or uh, you know the average of models that uh, have different dropouts applied to them. Um, so yeah, uh, for you, if you want to, you know, going back to the goals of this course, you are writing your project. You want to have uh, use the uh, softmax that's better calibrated. You can use one of these approaches to tweak it, and then uh, it might be a better, more tied to that interpretation that the softmax score, the max of the softmax vector, is the probability that uh, your predicted label is correct. And that's basically what I want to say about Bayesian approaches and what I want to say about uncertainty estimation. There is a lot in this topic. We could talk. We could have a whole course, I think, related to uncertainty quantification. For me, it's important that you know at least you know two, two directions you can take. One is to tweak uh, your um, 
your uh, softmax cores with the temperature scaling, super prominent approach, or maybe you can use um, a sample of different runs of your model or apply dropout. So you have at least three options of what you could do. And then this can be your baseline for, again, showing that your uh, explanations have more utility. I will be like a parrot and keep repeating this because it's a, it's a thing we don't really do in research a lot when we show utility of our explanations and this has to change. I think this uh, showing confidence scores together with your um, explainability is, uh, is a must because there are at least two papers that show that commonly proposed methods do not have any extra utility compared to these easy confidence scores, which is bad, right? Like, why are we producing these methods and writing these papers if, if they are no better than something like this? Yeah. All right, so questions about uncertainty. There are so many good puns I could produce with uncertainty and you potentially being uncertain. Okay. Let's let's assume then things are clear then. So what are we going to do now next for a um, couple of weeks is to talk about methods that can uh, answer why is this input assigned this answer. So we get our image, we classify it as uh, a dog, and we want to under answer to a person, okay, why the model is uh, saying this is a dog. And we are going to have multiple uh, approaches to this, obviously, because we have we are going to spend three weeks on this. And the first one will be to uh, explain in plain English why is this input assigned this label. Now, remember, or probably you forgot, but when I gave you this like overview lecture, I mentioned that this is actually the latest or technique we have introduced in this space. And I'm not following this historical perspective where I start with things like input attribution, meaning showing you important words or pixels, but rather with uh, something like this. My reasoning behind this is that I want to ground your thinking about prior methods in what we are doing these days, such that we can revisit them with these methods in mind. Like what are these older methods? Why are they still relevant if we can do something like this? And I think there is still a lot of relevance um, in these older techniques, uh, but you know, we have kind of an opportunity through this class to think about these questions, basically, uh, which probably we wouldn't otherwise. So just a reminder, uh, what are free text explanations? Those are explanations we give in plain language, and they immediately give us the gist of why some of the input is labeled as it is. I'll show you this post within um, uh, from Facebook where we pretend that in the background we have a model that predicts the factuality of this post, and this post is misleading. I mean, I made up the label misleading. And uh, and I said, okay, for this person, it would be useful to explain them why is this post uh, misleading? And we would uh, tell them all these facts that I don't want to read out loud now. And these all of these together, this little coherent story, that's a free text explanation here. It tells you exactly what you need to know and no more, no, no less. And... As I said, I'm gonna start with approach that's more recent, which is a uh, chain of thoughts. Chain of thoughts or free text explanations, the terminology is interchangeable. Uh, you could use one or the uh, or the other. They are both referring to the uh, to these explanations in plain uh, language, more or less. Um, and I put this photo here because this was uh, this is a photo from the Google I/O uh, event last year. Uh, where this technique was presented as something uh, major, right? So, and it is really important for uh, the things we are doing uh, in this space right now. So, so let's see what that is. And to understand what chain of thought prompting is, we need to understand what prompting is. So I will have a little digression into prompting unrelated to explanations. Then we are gonna talk about prompting to get the explanations. Okay, so in terms of prompting, we need to know another term, which is few-shot learning. 
And uh, in future learning, you know, we have this standard paradigm we had before. We have a pre-trained model, and then pre-trained model is done, and then we take it off shelf, and we have our data set with labels, and then we continue supervised fine tuning on it, and we get our model tailored for the for the task we we care about. Um, but recently, the past year or two, the trend, the main trend, is to decrease this. Uh, labeled data as lit to be as, as small as possible to the extent that we completely remove it and we just uh, ask our pre-trained model questions without ever tweaking it further to tweaking its parameters further to to be tailored more towards the task. Um, when we so few shot learning just means instead of using your uh, abundance of the training data for fine tuning, you are using just few examples. But few means it's really up to you, but a uh, prototypical research paper that claims few shot learning will use eight to 32 instances. So the, the data is really, really small. Um, remember in the normal machine learning, we had tens of, tens of thousands of instances. Now we decrease that to only um, let's say 16, and that really speaks for the power of the pre-training, how much useful information you capture implicitly by doing the, tech, the object training for objectives we mentioned, such as language modeling. So the simplest way to do few shot learning is to do exactly what we have been doing right now, exactly the same thing you are doing in your first assignment. You take a pre-trained model like the Berta, and then you continue training it, except of taking all 25,000 IMD instances you could have sampled only 16, and you would already be doing few shot learning. So that's the simplest way. Um, it is not the most efficient, and it's not most efficient because um, the way our model is pre-trained, um, the way we formatted instances for pre-training might be slightly different than what we have in our pure row instances of the task. And let me give you an example of um, summarization. So maybe somewhere in the pre-training data, the, there were mentions of summary or summarize this, or something, maybe someone in the internet had talked about summaries, which is totally conceivable. There is a whole subreddit TLDR for summarize something for me. Uh, there are summaries from news articles and so on. So having this in mind, we could kind of uh, be like, okay, model had maybe seen some aspects of the summarization during the pre-training. So what if we um, kind of reminded of it by saying in the beginning of our sequence, summarize or summarize this semicolon. So kind of play, play this game where you think, okay, maybe the model had implicitly seen some data uh, around summarization and I'm gonna remind it of it. So you will put these uh, little instructions in the beginning of your instances, such as TLDR, summarize, semicolon, and so on. Um, sometimes you wanna even add the task definition, such as in this task, you are given an article, your task is to summarize the article in a given sentence. You want to describe what the summarization uh, is. If you have used math language modeling as a pre-training objective, you want to also use that knowledge that you have pre-trained it like that. So for example, what people would do is for prompting math language models, they knew, okay, they have seen the mask tokens. So I could give them, uh, review, review text, and I can uh, write, thank you. Um, so what I wrote here is imagine you have some uh, review text and then you write this is and mask token. And then your model predicts is this positive or negative. So you're, you're kind of using the fact that it's been pre-trained with these instances to prompt it better. Okay. Um, so uh, just, to, uh, just to maybe mention more explicitly what you would do otherwise. Otherwise, uh, you would um, have a review. If you, if you are kind of 
just doing the standard fine tuning approach. You had a review, but then you had added extra parameters to your pre-trained model. Namely, you added the output matrix, right? The matrix of the size of dimension of your uh, representations with bird-like models, something around 768. And then if you had binary classification, we had two here. So every time you are fine tuning a pre-trained mass language model, you are adding a matrix like this and you need to learn its parameters. But because we decrease the fine tuning data so little, now it's a little bit, gets a little trickier to, to find what are the appropriate values of these uh, matrices. This is why this approach is better because you do not need to add any parameters. You are not, uh, not learning any new parameters from scratch. We are just tweaking the old parameters we already had before. Okay, so to kind of recap, um, I said before that um, all you need to do to do few shot learning is to do every, exactly the same thing you have been doing before, but to decrease the fine tuning data. That's true, but the more efficient approach would be that you also craft these instances in a in a more in a way that will uh, give you better results, such as the one I have illustrated with the examples of the iPad. And uh, when you craft your inputs outputs in this special way, what you are creating is a prompt. Um, it is a little bit overloaded term, though. Uh, sometimes people will refer to a prompt being only the task instructions. Uh, sometimes they will refer it to be instruction and more information and so on. So just have this in mind. I will use prompt to refer to all of this. So here we would have a task uh, description. This is a task where you are given a paragraph and a question about it, and you need to answer that question in the context of this paragraph. And this, uh, this data set uh, was, um, constructed in a way that we are probing the model's understanding of negation. Uh, so as an instruction, we would say, in this task, we are expected to write answers to given questions involving reasoning about negation. The answers to the questions should be yes, no, don't know, or a phrase in a passion, passage, questions can have only one correct answer. So this is our task description or instruction. And then we are given it uh, our passage, question, answer, semicolon, and the model has to generate the answer. Okay, any questions uh, about this? Yeah. So, so you're not explicitly in the pre training models in the open top of one word to the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess in, in an example that you are looking for, what would you put that at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this would be, this whole thing would be your input sequence. So the first word would be in and then blah, 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 all the way to the answer. So this would be just a sequence of so tokens. Yeah, this this whole thing is an input to the model. And the, the answer no is what the model generates. Okay, so... Uh, that's it. Uh, one thing I maybe worth mentioning as well, that you add these extra keywords to say what the other parts of the inputs are, like passage, question, answer. You are giving it uh, information about this. If you were using mass language model, maybe instead you would add separator tokens between passage, question, and answer. So it's always good to have in mind what your pre-trained model has seen and tailor your instances as close to uh, to that. Okay, so basically my, uh, what I said before, do what you have been doing uh, so far, just decrease the data stays, but instead of formatting the data anyway, uh, you, uh, you should craft them in, a, in, a, in this uh, specialized way and you will be producing prompts. And then this whole procedure will be called prompt-based fine-tuning. All right, that said, this is not something we do anymore, or if we do, we do it because we have very specialized tasks in mind. What we are doing is uh, something simpler, I think. 
So to motivate that other approach, imagine a situation where some lay person or an expert in other fields, such as let's say someone from humanities, maybe sociologist is interested in how these things are, what would they say about certain, let's say theory they, uh, they care about. And do we expect that these people will be able to do all of this to basically replicate your homework, you know, find a model, find data, uh, put everything in hugging face, uh, fine tune it, find GPUs and so on. Most likely they don't have that ability, right? Um, they don't have that knowledge nor resources to do something like that. So they don't have uh, access to model weights or no knowledge of how to train the model, uh, but they are able to provide you a few examples. They are able to tell the model, hey, this is what I want you to do. And here are for a few examples of uh, good examples of how you could do that task. So it would be nice if they could just provide those instances to the model, literally one after the other as one sequence, and the model then generates the output for them without changing any model weights. And uh, I will show you first uh, how, how this looks like. So we have a task description, which is the same task description we had before. We have our instance that we want to answer. So we don't know the answer for this one. Uh, we, we aim to do that. And in between, we are going to put a few examples. So here for these examples in blue color, we do have the true answer, right? We have answer no here and answer don't know here. And how many you would add here? You would add as many as you can fit in the, in the model uh, max input sequence left. Uh, today with um, the best large open source model, you can put 4,000 tokens uh, inside this. So you can actually add uh, enough of the examples uh, here. It gets problematic if your examples have long inputs, such as, as if you aim to answer a question from the context of a scholarly text that has few pages. So this line of work is still of how to handle inputs that are very long is an ongoing research direction in natural language processes. It's one of the things that's not uh, solved. Even though you know GPT-4 can fit 32,000 tokens, it's still not enough because again, scholarly text uh, can have 30,000 30, tokens. So you might fit only one paper in GPT-4's context. And there is an ambition to do something with you know, books, for example. You want to put a whole book into the model and get something out of it. So still unsolved problem, in case you are interested in working on it. Um, but going back to what we are actually talking about. Uh, so this whole thing uh, now brings us to in-context learning. So this approach, when you have your prompt being task instructions, then a few labeled examples, usually eight labeled example, and your evaluation example at the end, the one you don't know the answer for, that's your input. And um, you don't do any further training, no changes of the model's parameters, no gradient descent. Um, you don't deal with backpropagation. Uh, this is called in-context learning. So this, this approach, and it's become kind of status quo in, uh, in let's say natural language processing, but also kind of in vision uh, as well. So super, super important. Questions about this? I would really like you to fully figure, you know, understand what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah, so because you're not training these things, so you can kind of just do that every time you want to just generate another output or something. So the yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, let me write something down here. So your first step in this procedure will be to, I remember, uh, will be to pick eight examples. They're going to, I, I will use eight because it's pretty standard. So you pick eight uh, training examples from from uh, your training data and you will fix them. So you will not now for every single evaluation instance pick other eight examples because then that's not a shot learning anymore because you are seeing kind of giving to the model more data uh, than, uh, than just eight. 
So you pick eight and you fix them. And then for every evaluation instance, you are going to put the task description. This is also fixed, right? I mean, we are doing the same task all the time, right? Uh, you are going to then add your uh, examples from step one. So example one plus example, oops, eight. And then at the end, you are going to do your evaluation instance and ask the model the output. And you're going to repeat this for every single evaluation instance you have. But it's just a generation. You're just doing the inference out of the language model. You are not training it in any step of this. Now, there are two things. I want. I kind of place them for no reason at the end of this presentation on around, OK, there are too many slides in between. But there are. Um, Two things to consider here. Um, there is a sensitivity to this order here. So you could pick really good order of these eight examples and the model works really well. And you can pick really bad order of these exa eight examples and the model works really, really uh, terribly. So you want to shuffle these every time so for every evaluation instance, you, you reshuffle the order of these same eight examples. They're still the same as examples, but they just come in different orders. That's one thing you wanna do. And then there is a sensitivity to the choice of eight or whatever is your number of the number of examples you are going to put in the context. You might pick really good eight examples, getting really high performance, or unfortunately picking really bad eight examples and getting terrible performance. So you want to repeat this at least three times. Like uh, first time you pick eight for every evaluation instance, you get the output, you will get certain accuracy, right? Uh, once you are done with the all of them, I will instead write this here. You get the accuracy in the end or you know F1 score, whatever is the main metric for you. And if you repeat this three times, you will get accuracy one, accuracy two, accuracy three. And what you are going to report is the average. So if you hit really good eight examples, uh, it will cancel out with the other ones because the, the other ones which are not so fortunate will uh, not have uh, such a good accuracy. So these are the things you must do when you are doing in context learning. And of course, I mean, three is the min here, more is merrier. How do we decide like what exactly? Yeah, so you, you will randomly pick them just at random. That's why, uh, you know, having this uh, being repeated multiple times is also important, but it's also an active area of research how to choose good in context uh, examples. Uh, so there are certain techniques you could deploy to to uh, have a more robust in context learning. So, is the point of this mostly then to just determine how good uh, like if you're evaluating a large language model, like how possible it is to shuffle them into that app? Or could it be, like, I imagine that the point of it is not to uh, get the best results for that app. Yeah, so you would be surprised how effective this is. So this can sometimes give you um, very high performance and there is even no room for improvement. So you could fine tune a model and get a small you know, improvement, but it doesn't really matter. So this can be very powerful. Uh, but then if you're working in specialized domains, such as if you are having uh, text that's noisy or text that comes from a medical domain and whenever you are diverging from prototypical text seen on the web, these things might not work so well. And then fine tuning usually for these tasks is superior to in context learning. But this is this is really powerful and it's a, it's a great baseline. So if you are working on any kind of um, large language model related problem and you deem you might make it better, run this first to be sure that your 
you are not already having super high uh, results. Uh, this is a strong baseline. Yeah. Uh, the model actually forgets you said it, right? Um, forgets. Yeah, so the more you talk, it will it forget that you gave those instructions at the beginning, and it will sort of. Mm -hmm. So that's a good. Really good question. Um, I recently seen a paper where uh, they have been investigating the position bias um, uh, of uh, if the important information, so they know what the important information for solving the task is, and they give it in the beginning of the context or at the end, that's better than in the middle. So I think uh, there is a, it's a bias of whether it's in the beginning or at the at the end. Uh, and that will seemingly, if you, if you put it somewhere in the middle, you, you might have a drop in performance. Uh, this is something I can share to you after the lecture. And I think it's still, there is a lot we are kind of discovering in this space of terms of how to do this uh, the best. So there is a lot of going on in this space. Another, a little bit mind blowing result is, but let me go at the end. Um, so we talked about sensitivity to the choice of the uh, few examples, but then there is also sometimes no sensitivity to shuffling the labels. So what this paper uh, had uh, initially shown, and this still ongoing discussion about the result, there are a few papers that came after it to kind of uh, give more perspective to the results. But nevertheless, let me, let me tell you what exactly you are seeing here. So. Um, when we give eight uh, examples here, we are giving the true label, right? So we have, um, for example, example one could be um, review and then positive. And example two could be an, another review. We'll put it one and two and negative. And of course, a reasonable thing to do is to put them in the right order, right? Review, it's labeled, and second review, it's labeled. What this paper has done is they randomly sampled whatever review here. They just pick at random, positive or negative. So it's not the true label necessarily, it's whatever is the outcome of the random selection. That's what they do, and I suspect that your intuition is that this shouldn't be working, right? That if we are giving few examples and we are not giving the appropriate label for those few examples, it's going to be bad for the model. What this paper is shown that it's not really uh, necessarily bad for the model. So here, let me turn on the laser. Um, in yellow, you have demonstrations, meaning examples. I didn't mention that sometimes these few examples we put in the context that will be called shots, examples, demonstrations. So it's a, there is different terminologies. Here they are using demonstrations. Demonstrations with correct label are in yellow. Demonstrations with random labels are in red. Now let's compare the performance between those two. There is almost no performance for the difference in performance of these two models. But if we have no demonstrations in the context, there is a huge drop. Then again, huge, huge drop if we do, do not have demonstrations, but whether we give the gold label or not, doesn't really matter. Uh, and you can observe similar situation with other tasks. This is kind of a little bit mind bending when you first see it, and it's, uh, it is really surprising result. Uh, their conclusions in the paper is, are two. First is that, um, this, when you have no examples in the context, this is called zero shot. And usually zero shot works worse than few shots. So when you give few examples, the model will work better because it has seen what we are expecting. But the outcome of this is to say, well, if we are giving no actually human label examples here, just the input text with a random label, then the zero shot baseline is actually way higher. So if you want to say my few shot result is better than zero shot, instead of showing this um, baseline with, uh, with you know, no demonstrations, you should be showing uh, this one. 
Uh, and then you should show them that your whatever is you are introducing is higher than red bars here. That's the that's the first kind of practical recommendation. But of course, the the question we all care about is why why does this happen at all? Um, and they provide some insights of why this might be happening. They say that uh, the what might be important for the model is the distribution of the text. Like what kind of text do we care about? And giving few uh, few just texts uh, input texts puts it in the place in its you know whatever is its space of solutions kind of pushes it to the to the right place. And why do we then need to give any labels where we need to kind of say it what the label set is? We need to say that we care only about positive or negative and kind of showing whatever with every instance is seemingly uh, a good way to do that. So yeah, these are the current observation. I also recommend reading this uh, pay blog post, this one. Um, so this is just a blog post from the author of the of the paper that showed these intriguing results, together with the uh, author of another paper that provides mathematical framework for why in context learning works. And they are trying to kind of marry their uh, Sivon's uh, uh, observations together with that theory. And that theory is actually a Bayesian approach. So you can kind of uh, utilize both things you have learned and heard uh, today. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sure you have gazillion questions and I feel like I digressed a lot. So let me stop and see what, what, what are you thinking? Yeah. Um, when you talk about learning and machine learning topics, we're often talking about learning values and parameters, not parameters. But then, in the complex learning, there's no learning happening per se, mm -hmm. because one parameter is the thing. So, why yeah. is it called in complex learning? You and Vivek should have a coffee and rant about this. He has a, it's his uh, also pet peeve that this is called learning. Yeah, I don't know why. I think, um, yeah. Uh, you know, whoever coined the term, I don't even know who coined the current term. I should probably check this out. Um, uh, yeah, probably they just made a stretch in, in a sense. Sorry, second? Open AI. Open AI? GPT. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if you stretch your imagination, you can, um, you know, when you give examples, you're kind of, teaching the model the 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 whatever the first of the format you want you know like you know how these are language models so they can generate any word you want so by giving them examples you are constraining them to generate the subset of the answer possible words you are interested in um so in maybe in that sense you know you are kind of telling them something to do and in that sense it's uh it's learning but yeah, you are right that in a technical sense, this is not learning. Yeah, because you are not changing anything. So yeah, you will need to stick stick with it. <laughs> but it is learning in like the context of that certain problem, right? It has to be you know, like somehow including like whatever the distribution of the learning. Yeah, it's definitely doing something with it, but uh, I think the the um that nothing is happening with the model itself once it, it gives you the output. It never changes any of its parameters. And in that sense, you didn't learn it anything. You didn't teach it anything new. You just retrieved what the, it knows. Like already encoded. It's already encoded, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, for this kind of emerged, I guess, in 2021 is when the original GPT-3 has been released. And then very quickly we adapted to this way of doing predictions. And then a year later, I was like, oh my God, like it's kind of crazy we can do this. Every, every once in a while, I'm like <gasps> re shocked by the fact that uh, we replaced uh, traditional learning uh, with gradient descent and you know optimization of the parameters where it's something like this. Um, that said, I mean, there are a few NLP students here and you all are still fine tuning things, you know, it's not like the fine tuning became obsolete. Um, so as soon as you start working on tasks that are slightly different, 
Um, and it's hard to describe what are different tasks. It's, you know, if you are in the field, you get intuition for what the different task is, then fine tuning is super helpful. So uh, we all still change parameters and deal with <laughs> GPUs. Okay, so let's maybe go a few steps back. Um, I don't know where, where we are even. Okay, so okay, let me let me kind of recap what we have been talking about. We have been talking about prompting, which is crafting your instances in a way that retrieves the uh, whatever the model has acquired during excuse me, pre-training. So that's what prompting is. And then we can just learn about in-context learning, which is uh, you do that, you craft your instances and you give the task instruction and you put everything in a single sequence and all your model is doing is generation of the label. No training whatsoever. And that's called in-context learning. But what, the reason why we are talking about prompting is because we want to learn what the chain of thoughts are, and remember, this is associated with explanations given in plain uh, language. So what chain of thoughts are is very simple to describe. Uh, you will add to what we have seen before. Um, so still we have task instruction, excuse me. Um, okay, so we have a task instruction, we have our instance, but instead of just having answer semicolon don't know, like we had before, we are going to give a reason here. Uh, so we are going to have, let's think step by step. From the passage, it is unclear whether Bastarda was a technique that was impactful and important, which are reasons why one expects to see it regularly in an academic paper on musical theory. So the answer is don't know. So you put this explanation in plain English before the answer. And that's it. That's chain of thoughts. So you have your prompt task instructions and examples with an, with an explanation and you have answer listing step by step and you get explanation. So the answer is, is a technique of uh, prompting and it's a uh, term with a chain of thoughts. Again, you don't do any further uh, fine tuning. So this paper uh, called Yima or Kojima et al. They found that if you do this, let's think step by step, then the performance is uh, increases. And then paper by Wei et al. found that, okay, if you add explanation, so the answer is, then the performance increases. Both of these papers are focusing on these explanations from the perspective of model performance. So they do not do what we are talking about in this class, which is how useful these explanations are or whether they are plausible, whether they are faithful. They didn't test any of these properties. All they care is whether the performance will increase by forcing the model to first reason, which is a worthy goal in itself, of course. Um, and another thing that, uh, especially in the paper by Wei et al, what, that was uh, introduced is doing this at a larger model scales. And, when you increase the model size to be very large, at the time, uh, this is a paper written by authors who are affiliated with Google. Google had released the model Palm, which was kind of their version of GPT-3 original, and it has a size of larger than 500 billion parameters. So these authors had the opportunities to study this phenomenon at very different scale. And what they found is that if you are using smaller models, you might not see model benefits to the model performance, but if you are at the larger scale and you do something like this, then the performance increases. Um, so this, it was kind of the first, I would say, um, people really wanted to use explanations to improve their results. It's called lear learning from explanations. Uh, this paper had first major improvements from learning from explanations, and that made a whole lot of difference. I said that they have seen that the smaller scales of the model size, they didn't observe this. This now emerged as a research direction in uh, NLP where you want to teach your smaller models to have these abilities. So people do all sorts of things like bootstrapping reasoning from reasoning or distilling uh, these uh, uh, explanations from larger models into smaller ones. There are all sorts of things that people uh, care about uh, right now to have our smaller models uh, be better at this. Um, 
Okay, so my next goal is to show you one model that can that is trained to be really good at this. But before we do that, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Um so chain of thoughts is few shot learning. I think there is some confusion of what few shot learning is. So few shot learning is uh, any kind of technique where you give only a few examples to the model. So it's a super set of both prompt based fine tuning and uh, any kind of prompting like chain of thoughts prompting. Uh, so we can't say that, you know, this is better than few shot learning. Uh, but if you are thinking maybe about fine tuning with few examples. All of them concatenated together. Oh, that's the difference between chain of thoughts and the few shot learning. No, no, no. Okay, let's then go over that. So with few shot learning, oh, I don't know why I opened this. Okay. So first uh few shot learning is um Uh, the size of your training data is uh, n. I will actually use k because it's common to use it, k. And uh, k is small. Like k um, is in a range of, you know, uh, 1 to maybe 32. That's few shot learning. Then we had... Um, we had prompt based fine tuning uh, where so every evaluation instance um, was okay, maybe that's not the main difference. Um, me, I, I think all you need to kind of remember that you change uh, model parameters or weights. with um, gradients, right? You do back propagation. So that's from base fine tuning, but we are still crafting prom like examples as prompts. Then we had in-context learning, very often uh, abbreviated as ICL, where you had um, your prompt is the um, instruction, uh, instruction plus uh, K examples plus uh, evaluation instance. And then chain of thought abbreviated very often as COT adds explanations here for every example. Now, if you are wondering why are we not using these kinds of prompts with eight examples and then find, do fine tuning, that's also done. That's called, and that's what we are going to talk about next. That's called uh, instruction fine tuning. And the most important reason why we want to do something like this is because we want to induce those in-context learning abilities in smaller models, which might not have ability to do so, you know, they didn't acquire it implicitly, but if we fine tune it with contexts like that, and then we give them at the test time, few new few examples, they might do this uh, better. So yeah, there is few shot learning, from base fine tuning, in context learning, chain of thoughts, and the instruction fine tuning, but few shot learning is uh, is you know umbrella for all of them. All right, so um, I want to mention one more thing that's called self consistency, which will be another ingredient we need for this model that I want to introduce. And here you are going to do chain of thought prompting. And something that I never mentioned is how we actually decode words. Uh, the, I remember when I showed you the, there is a current word, current tokens representation. You multiply it with the matrix of the size of the number of tokens in vocabulary. You get the uh, vector of the size of the number of words in vocabulary. And then you, and then I said, 
and then you take the max. That's not necessary. That's one way to then decode the word. And this is called greedy decoding. When you take the uh, highest value in your self-max vector, um, but there are other types of decoding, um, such as nucleus sampling, where you have, again, that temperature uh, that we have seen with temperature scaling, where you kind of soften the uh, probability, the, the values in the softmax a little bit, such that you don't always sample the same tokens for the same instance. That's why if you ever had uh, play around with GT GPT models and any kind of APIs, you give it the same input, but then you get different outputs. There is stochasticity in it. And that's why, because the, the, the reason behind this is that uh, the decoding technique we use is not with greedy decoding. Now, uh, this self-consistency decoding, another way of decoding, does the following. They are doing chain of thoughts prompting, meaning they prompt their model to give them a reasoning plus the answer. But instead of doing that only once, they do it multiple times and where they don't use greedy decoding, but rather they introduce some stochasticity. So they can get for the same input, they can get uh, here three, three different uh, generations. And here they had uh, two generations agreeing with each other, being consistent. They say that the answer is 18 and give, um, same reasoning, but slightly different. And then the third one, which is disagreeing with these ones. And what they do is they marginalize the, um, the uh, final answer. So they take the um, not important uh, what this exact uh, equation is here, but in, the, in a way they consider that there was a variance across these uh, different runs. If you're now thinking mm, variance, we have talked about dropout and different model ensembles. Can I use this as a, as a confidence uh, uh, to calibrate the probabilities? That's kind of it, basically. You are kind of taking different generations and marginalizing over them and you are then kind of uh, calibrating the model. Um, and there is uh, one paper I forgot to cite here where they actually deploy this. They they use the the variation across these uh, different um, uh, different answers to say something about the confidence. I believe the paper is called "Large Language Models in Cold Biomedical Knowledge" or something like that. Um, I will I will link it uh, somewhere in these slides. Okay, so now we are coming to that model I wanted to introduce, and I hope you will use. Uh, and it's called Flenty5. Uh, Flenty5 is an encoder-decoder model, not any, but T5. Remember when I mentioned it a couple of times back, it is uh, one of those that was pre-trained with a span corruption and uh, a suit of supervised tasks like machine translation summarization. Uh, remember I mentioned this one uh, and I said for a while it was the largest available large language model of the uh, size of 11 billion. So. And, and, and then I said something along the lines that, that people therefore would do extra things on top of it. And therefore uh, uh, we have stuff like uh, Flint T5. There was extra layers of why they use T5. This is a T5 was introduced in Google. This Flint T5 is also introduced in Google. Uh, Flint T5 has a very neat code base where if you have Google's hardware TPUs, it's very easy to further train uh, with lots of data uh, T5 model. You just need their code base and their access to TPUs. You add um, extra data loader for your data and that's it. The hard part is getting the access to their TPUs. Um, okay, and uh, what uh, what the authors of Flint T5 have done is they further train T5 to follow instructions, uh, meaning they crafted their examples to, um, to um, have instruction and then few examples uh, in between the, the last instance you want to predict. Uh, they also have introduced some chain of thoughts. They, they couldn't do it for every task because uh, you need some human written uh, explanations to put in the context. And they also uh, used self-consistency. Self-consistency we have seen before to, and both of these are to elicit reasoning skills. Uh, and they have also examples where 
they concatenated for fused examples to induce in context learning. When you fine tuned with examples like this, it's called instruction fine tuning. And when you have instruction at the beginning. Um, they did this with 18 hundreds of tasks um, and all of their data. So basically they compiled everything that was kind of released in NLP in terms of data sets and I uh, use it to further fine tune T5. Um, here is a snapshot from their paper. These are different fine tuning tasks they have. Uh, most of them come from these collections called um, Natural Instruction uh, version two. Uh, and you can see that only four of the tasks and four of the data sets they have introduced have a chain of thoughts. Therefore, they could you know, train the model to produce a chain of thoughts only for these kinds of uh, tasks. Um, so yeah, this is, a, this is a great model if you are interested in exploring um, a chain of thoughts. Uh, with the model, you still have access uh, to the to its weights. In, in case you want to do an extra tweaks to the parameters, uh, and you can use this model and prompt it to let's think by step by step, and it will output you some reasoning. Not every model will do this. Uh, if you try to do let's think step by step with Bert, it will not do anything. So you really need uh, models that have been instruction fine tuned to to do so. Um, so definitely a model to have in mind, a great baseline for your fine tuning experiments as well. Uh, if you need a model to fine tune, this is this could be your uh, your first choice. Um, that said, things are moving fast in our uh, field. So um, what we have learned so far in this course is pre-training with self-supervised objectives like language modeling and uh, mass language modeling. Now we have just learned about uh, big instruction fine tuning using ton of data, uh, data coming from 18,000 of tasks. Um, and that's not it. So your latest and greatest large language model has more layers to it. So this, uh, this is a diagram from the Llama chat paper, which is uh, the latest uh, open source uh, large language model and kind of the state of the art for the um, open source large language model. Still not as good as GPT-4, but this is the best uh, in terms of the models we have access to, to its weights. And the extra layers that we have here uh, is all around something called RLHF, which stands for reinforcement learning from human feedback. Now, this all, all is uh, what we are doing right now in this space is trying to make these models more useful for actual interactions you might have with this model. So, you know, what we what we tasks we have developed in NLP are not uh, prototypical tasks people do when they engage with these models. You know, we we have tasks for coreference or semantic role labeling or question answering of many flavors, but we do not have um, typical task didn't include something like, oh, I'm gonna do this in Latte. How can I tweak this uh, stupid thing to make it work, you know? And this is kind of what we are tweaking models to do these days. Um, all right, I hope you see this. Um, this, is, this is from kind of illustration of this part of RLHF. Uh, you are always going to start with fine tuning your model, and then you're going to get what we call SFT, which stands for supervised, uh, supervised fine tune model. Then from that model, you are going to get some samples. You are going to get some generations and you are going to recruit some people who will tell you which generations they like better. So you get for your uh, four generations, you get preference uh, uh, between them. And then you are going to go into the RL part, the reinforcement learning part, which contains some kind of reward model, which tells you, given your generation, how good that generation is. It gives you a score, a reward. Um, and you need the reward to train the rest of the RL uh, components, uh, such as the value and so on. Um, so the actual algorithm looks mega scary, not super important. Uh, in case you want to know ins and outs, I recommend uh, this uh, this uh, this thing. Um, the yeah, basically, I don't want to go too much into RLHF because it's again 
a huge uh, topic we could talk about uh, for for a long time. I hope some of you are taking the course by Professor Daniel Brown, where you will probably learn details of these kinds of things. But have in mind again, we are going to go back, you know, through through these older techniques for local explanations. And this is the kinds of things I want you to have in mind that we are not in this space anymore, right? Things got really complicated. And how do we kind of reconcile all of these bits and pieces while we are using these techniques which were not you know, necessarily designed to handle all of this is something we want to take care of. Because then there is also a lot of opportunity for research, right? Like these are open questions to think about, oh, there is something we have used so far, but now everything changed, when, whether those things still can work. And if not, can we tweak something here to make them work? So yeah. Although we didn't understand bits and pieces of RLHF, it's important for me that you understand there are these three major components to large language models. Self-supervised pre-training, large uh, instruction fine-tuning, and now reinforcement learning from human feedback. Okay, and that's where we are going to stop for, for today. <laughs>